it's 10.30, so I guess we will start. I think we're missing a few, but I hope. another activity for you, but we'll get to that later. Uh, so my goal for today, uh, finish chapter five and then help you uh, with preparation for the exam on Thursday. So we have a couple of activities uh, for preparation. Hey, hey Brent. And, uh, okay. uh, so uh, let's take care of the first things first. So, uh, exam on on Thursday. Uh, please don't forget your calculator. I will have a, a couple of extra calculators available, uh, and then just something to write with. It's uh, this is an upper division class, so all essay, uh, short answer. Um, gosh, I have lots of study materials. As as we go through the review activity today. Uh, if you have other specific questions that we're not covering, just raise your hand. Um, so, um, have a good review today after Chapter 5. So, uh, Chapter 5 is on training adaptations. And so, uh, we see adaptations in enzymes. Because remember, it's enzymes that allow for ATP production. So, each of our metabolic pathways, phosphagen, glycolytic, oxidative, they all have enzymes that are emphasized. They all have uh, rate-limiting enzymes. So it's, it's the rate-limiting enzymes that we see increases, and that's very important because uh, then we can produce faster ATP production. So in terms of glycolytic enzymes, uh, we see increased glycolytic activity. So glycolytic pathway, that's those uh, 10 reactions. We start with glucose and we end with pyruvate and or lactate. So if it's fast glycolysis, glycolytic pathway, we're ending with uh, lactate. So we see enzymes that uh, are more active as part of that pathway. Um, so three in particular, uh, phosphofructokinase. And so, you know, that's uh, reaction number three in the glycolytic pathway. And so that's our rate limiting enzyme and so if that's the slowest step and we have increased activity of that one then that's really important because we go through that bottleneck uh, so to speak a little bit faster uh, glycogen phosphorylase so that's the enzyme that uh, breaks down glycogen so glycogen is composed of glucose units and so we're breaking off glucose and, uh, and prepping it to go through those uh, steps of glycolysis uh, lactate dehydrogenase. Uh, we know there are different isoforms of lactate dehydrogenase. Some of the isoforms uh, are likely to convert pyruvate to lactate. Other isoforms have less affinity for pyruvate, so pyruvate is more likely to go into the mitochondria to be converted to acetyl-CoA. Uh, so we'll get into those things. But um, as you look at those uh, 10 reactions. Remember the first five, that's the energy investment phase. And so if you're starting with blood glucose, you have to invest in ATP at steps one and three. Uh, if you're starting with glucose from glycogen, which is preferable, uh, glycogen already there in the muscle, getting glucose from that, then you spend one less ATP. And so it's just step three. Uh, and then everything after step five is repeated twice, so uh, two times. So you're making four total ATP. So you make an ATP at step seven and step 10. So repeated twice, you get a total of four. So starting with blood glucose, if you spend two and make four, then that is two. If you start with glucose from glycogen, you spend one, you make four. Uh, so then the net is, is three. Um, so glycogen phosphorylase would be active right here in breaking down glycogen. Uh, phosphofructokinase uh, active here at step three. 
uh, and lactate dehydrogenase would be all the way down here uh, in converting pyruvate to lactate. So we have increased activity of some key enzymes in this pathway. So as we talked about in, in chapter three, uh, we have different isoforms of LDH. Slow, so slow twitch fibers have isoforms one and two. Fast twitch fibers have isoforms four and five. Um, and I think it was Courtney asking what happened to isoform three and I just remembered that and I never looked it up so I should look it up. So I'm, I apologize for that, but um, we do have different isoforms with more or less affinity for pyruvate. So uh, with endurance training, uh, you get what you train for, right? So if you're doing a lot of that type of activity, relatively low intensity, long duration, uh, you're converting fibers into more of a slow twitch phenotype, then you're going to get the LDH1. So if you begin with fast twitch fibers, but you're training those fast twitch fibers like slow twitch fibers, and people do that. There's people that have lots of fast twitch fibers and they train them like slow twitch fibers because they happen to like endurance activity, which is great. Um, but what happens is uh, you switch all of that LDH5 to LDH1 so uh, pyruvate is more likely to enter into the mitochondria. So LDH1 has less affinity. What does it mean to have affinity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one or to bind to in, in this case. So LDH1 has less affinity for pyruvate and so pyruvate is more likely to be shuttled into the mitochondria. Uh, with strength and sprint training, exactly opposite. So you're sending your muscles a different signal with this type of training. So it's amazing that your muscles will change exactly according to the training that you do. So uh, if your objective is to gain a whole bunch of muscle size, you probably don't want to overdo it on the endurance training because that's sending a mixed signal to your muscles. So uh, we talked about having a base level of aerobic conditioning, which is different than doing an excessive amount of endurance training in this case. So um, at any rate, if you do lots of strength and sprint training, then you're going to get conversion uh, into the LDH5 type. So this type is, is more fast acting. Um, it, it has a greater affinity for pyruvate, which means pyruvate's likely to be converted to lactate. So uh, as we talked about in chapter three, there's lots of things we can do with lactate. So we can convert lactate to glucose. And what do we call that cycle? On the back row? <laughs> Recycle? I'd say that all semester long. You get <laughs> just already tired of it. Uh, so what else can we do with lactate? What other tissues can use lactate? So the heart and the liver, right, can take it in and just use it like usual. Even lactate can be used within the same fiber, simply shuttled into the mitochondria, converted to lactate. Um, if it's a fast twitch fiber, sometimes the fast twitch fiber will uh, get rid of the lactate and then that lactate will be taken up by a slow twitch fiber. So uh, the lactate is a usable substrate. So for years, the misconception was that you have this evil waste product in your muscles that's doing all the damage and making you sore and all that, simply not true. So lactate is a, is a usable energy substrate. It's kind of a temporary substrate that really the body either converts back to lactate or back to glucose or pyruvate when things uh, proceed as normal. So uh, mitochondrial enzymes. So this is where we have our oxidative metabolism. So it makes sense. These are the oxygen uh, carrying organelles of a cell. So that's where the oxygen ends up. So there would have to be a pretty high correlation between your mitochondrial content and your VO2 max. So I wonder if that's ever been researched. You'd have to have equipment where you could get a biopsy of muscles that are involved with an activity and then you'd 
see in a, in a sample of tissue uh, the number of mitochondria, but um, it seems logical to assume that if you have a very high VO2 max, then you must have a lot of mitochondria because that's where the oxygen actually goes to make ATP. So with endurance training, we increase both the size and the number. The number was is easy to conceptualize. Larger mitochondria is harder to conceptualize, and I'm still kind of working through this where, okay, so if you have a larger mitochondria, do you have more than one electron transport chain? That's something that I've wondered about, and I, I think the answer is probably yes. Where there's more than one electron transport chain, it, it would make sense. A larger mitochondria would have space for, for more than one uh, area where you're producing these ATP. So still kind of looking for the answer to that one. I need to ask somebody that, that knows more. Um, you have increased oxidative uh, enzyme activity. So, um, so remember that the rate limiting enzymes from the Krebs cycle, isocitrate, dehydrogenase, and then you have uh, cytochrome oxidase from the electron transport chain. So those are just a couple of examples of, of oxidative type enzymes. Uh, so <clears throat> also interesting that mitochondria increases are specific to the muscles trained. And that, that's, that's interesting because you take, okay, so you take someone that uh, won the Tour de France, I won't say the name, won the Tour de France seven times, I think, uh, but then after um, retiring from cycling, decides to run a marathon, and you think, wow, so elite cycling athlete um, decides to run a marathon. So marathon time was somewhere around two hours and 30 minutes, okay, which is a good time. I mean, that's a good good time, but is it an elite time? No, it's not. So um, the adaptations to muscles are, are specific. You use your legs for cycling, you use your legs for running, but it's different, it's a different activation pattern. So uh, the way that muscle fibers are used for cycling is different than the way fibers are used for running. So um, mitochondria are specific to the fibers that are most used. Uh, for a specific activity. So there's a little bit of transfer, but, but not 100% between two different endurance activities. So if you can imagine how difficult it is for someone to train for a triathlon. So you have three different endurance type activities and you have to be good at all three. So typically a triathlete, uh, as, as I've talked to a few of them, uh, most of them have one that they're really good at, and then they kind of have to work on the other two. So um, how many of you, would it, it would be swimming. It would be the tough one. Okay, swimmers. I sink like a rock, no matter what. Um, running, cycling, I maybe do okay with those. Uh, swimming's tough. You have to be really efficient. And once you see someone that can swim really well, it's just effortless. So... Um, triathlon is a tough sport. Um, so you have larger transport sites for, for pyruvate with more mitochondria. Um, another adaptation is more myoglobin. So we have hemoglobin in the blood and that carries oxygen. And then uh, oxygen uh, diffuses from the blood into the muscle due to the pressure difference. And once in the muscle, uh, myoglobin becomes the carrier. So then myoglobin shuttles the oxygen uh, to the mitochondria. Typically, mitochondria are located on the periphery of a cell. So for a muscle cell, uh, that would be just under the sarcolemma, just under that membrane. So that makes sense because if the mitochondria were, were deep in the cell, the oxygen would have a greater uh, distance to, to diffuse. So we want the mitochondria in a, in a spot where the oxygen can uh, readily get into there. So the rate of diffusion through the cytoplasm uh, increases. Okay, so looking on the anaerobic side of things, uh, we have a larger storage of ATP 
that's good, right? So three seconds of maximal activity, we have enough storage for that. So we might have a little more storage, maybe going from three to five seconds of activity. So we're maintaining power for longer. Uh, PCR, what does PCR stand for? Yeah, so possible creatine increases. And that's a, that's a big one for anaerobic athletes. So um, there's evidence that you can supplement with uh, creatine monohydrate and you get some increase in your phosphocreatine stores. So that's, that's, a, that's important. Uh, creatine monohydrate is probably the most studied over-the-counter supplement of all time. And uh, first became available over-the-counter in 1993. Uh, most of the studies, especially those that study anaerobic type fitness qualities, wind gate test performance, lifting performance, sprint performance, show some show benefits to the creatine monohydrate supplementation. So um, it's a nice one to take on a budget and it's, it's uh, cheap and effective. Um, so increased activity of creatine kinase. So creatine kinase. Uh, that's the one reaction of the phosphagen system, right? So we're taking uh, ADP and phosphocreatine is the phosphate donor, right? And so the creatine kinase uh, facilitates that reaction. So creatine phosphate donates phosphate to ADP to make uh, ATP. So that's the quickest source of ATP. So we're able to have a faster production or replenishment of ATP. So the, the take home message is that you can sprint longer without losing your power output. So for a Wingate test, if, if you could hang on to your peak power for five seconds, maybe after creatine supplementation, you could hang on to it for maybe 10 seconds before things start to, to drop due to fatigue. So uh, notice that um, we get adaptation both anaerobically and aerobically. So there's, depending on the training you do, uh, that determines the changes in your body. So this big table, we're going to do an activity here in just a few minutes uh, to look at. This is kind of a, a nice summary of everything from the chapter um, in terms of fuel supply, enzyme activity, oxygen utilization, lactate accumulation, ATP production, storage, and turnover. So the basic message from fuel supply is we spare carbohydrate. We spare carbohydrate. So carbohydrate is in limited supply. So we have a limited supply in muscle and the liver. Uh, so we're sparing carbohydrate, which means we're relying more on what? Fatty acids, so you can see all these lines, increased mobilization, transport, beta oxidation, increased fat storage adjacent to the mitochondria, increased utilization of fat as a fuel, and so on. So we spare carbohydrate, we use more fatty acids as, as we reach better levels of conditioning. With protein, we have a better ability to convert amino acids to glucose. So what do we call that process, converting a non-carbohydrate to glucose? What's the G word for that? gluconeogenesis, so all types of G words with metabolism. So which amino acids are we likely to use? So we have our, our branch chain, what are those three? Valine, and then what's the other one that is really common that we talked about? Alanine. Yeah, alanine. So those, those four were likely to convert over to the gluconeogenic pathway. So gluconeogenesis takes place in the liver. So it's not something that a muscle cell does. So a muscle cell doesn't take, take in uh, alanine and convert it to glucose. The liver does that and then the glucose goes from the liver back to the, to the muscle. Uh, enzyme activity. So think of specific enzymes, uh, especially glycolytic enzymes, okay, phosphofructokinase, uh, glycogen phosphorylase, lactate dehydrogenase. So we get an upregulation of, of enzymes that makes uh, more ATP production. Uh, O2 utilization. So if we're relying more on fat, 
and fat requires more oxygen to break down, then we're, we're increasing our capacity to utilize oxygen. So that translates into more mitochondria, okay, greater size of mitochondria. We just talked about an increase in, increase in myoglobin concentration. Here's something, a reduction in the oxygen deficit. What is the oxygen deficit to review? Oxygen deficit, what is it? Is it the, at the beginning or at the end of a workout? It's the beginning, yes. So in the beginning, we don't have uh, sufficient oxygen available for the oxidative pathway to support the intensity. So what do we have to do? How do we support the intensity initially if the oxidative pathway is not warmed up yet? Yeah, phosphagen glycolytic can provide a quick source of ATP, at least temporarily, until the oxidative pathway is up and running at, at maximal capacity. Um, uh, reduction in uh, EPOC at the same absolute submaximal workload. So all that means is that you're able to recover faster. So re a reduction in EPOC means that you're coming back down to baseline oxygen consumption much, much faster. So that indicates you're more conditioned. Uh, lactate accumulation, okay, so you have an increased, what does MCT1 stand for? Mm -hmm. Monocarboxylate transporters, yeah, so that makes sense. You have more transporters to get lactate out of the cell, and probably also what comes with lactate that is really the acidosis mm -hmm. cause. Yeah, hydrogen ions are transported with uh, lactate out of the cell through the MCT transporters. Um, so if you're getting more conditioned, you're more likely to emphasize oxidative metabolism. Pyruvate's more likely to go into the mitochondria, which means less or more lactate production. So if pyruvate's going into the mitochondria, there's less, gonna be less lactate production. So you see that brought out here less lactate accumulation at the same absolute workload. Um, so we're gradually able to handle a higher exercise intensity without crossing the anaerobic threshold. Just means we're getting in, in more condition. We can handle a higher intensity, um, much higher aerobic intensity before we become anaerobic. Um, and then we talked about the ATP. So we produce ATP faster. Uh, we have more of it. Um, we have more phosphocreatine, which makes production of uh, replenishment of ATP faster as well. Okay, so to tie all this together, um, we're going to do an activity. This is a check your comprehension from the textbook. So you're going to have two columns. So you can uh, put this wherever you want. If you, you may have... You may have a nice, nice space right here on the bottom of the, our review, if you want. So it says your task is to make two columns labeled pre-training and post-training. Pre-training and post-training. So you have a bunch of variables. Some of these variables are maximal values. Some of them are submaximal values. Some of them describe resting content of different substances. Uh, and they're not in order. So your task is to look at each variable like VO2 max and taking into account, okay, so our values obtained from a 25 year old male at rest and during an incremental treadmill test to maximum before and after a six month endurance training program that included both continuous and interval sessions. Okay. So your task is to report which value represents the pre-value, which value represents the post-value. So in terms of VO2 max, uh, you have two values there. One is 48.3 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body mass per minute. The other value is 42.6 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So knowing what you know, which value would be the pre-value, which value would be the post-value? Pretty easy, right? 
Yeah, so it's going to be 42.6 is where he started. 48.3 is where he ended after training. Okay, now let me give you some counsel on these other things. So if you're talking about a maximal value, you're going to have an increase from the pre to the post. If you're talking about a maximal value, as hard as they can possibly push themselves, you're going to have an increase from the pre to the post. So VO2 max, you had an increase from the pre to the post because it's a maximal value. Okay, so looking at the next one, respiratory exchange ratio max. So at the end of this exercise test, the maximal respiratory exchange ratio, maximal values are going to increase from the pre to the post. So 1.06, and by the way, 1.06, regardless of whether you're a pre or post, suggests what about the respiratory exchange ratio? What was this person utilizing? 100% carbs or fats? Carbs, because the closer the value gets to one or even greater than one, we are relying 100% on carbohydrates. What about lower values as the RER comes down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our resting value, what is the resting value for RER, like right now? 0 0.85. 0 0.85, which is about 51% fat, 49% carbohydrate, according to that table. What about during the epoch period? What do we tend to see in the RER? Yeah, so down to maybe 0.81 or 0.82, which indicates what is your body doing during the EPOC period that is so useful for body composition? You're burning a lot of fat calories, higher than a resting metabolism. So it's so important to, if you can, if you have no cardiovascular limitations or orthopedic limitations, work out really, really hard because you're getting all of those fat burning benefits after the workout. Um, so RER max, you're going to have a 1.11 was the post value, 1.06 was the pre value. Now, I'm going to help you with number three, and then I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. Respiratory exchange ratio at six miles per hour. So we can only assume that that's a submaximal intensity. So what pattern are we going to see if it's submaximal? you're going to see a reduction from the pre to the post. If it's submax, a reduction from the pre to the post because submaximally exercise becomes harder or easier. It becomes easier with training. If it's not maximal, it becomes easier. So you're gonna have a reduction if the variable is submaximal. So at the pretest, it's gonna be 0.93. At the post test, it's going to be 0.84 because it's now become easier. And because the respiratory exchange ratio is dropping, what does that suggest this person is able to utilize more of after training? RER is dropping. More fatty acid utilization. So we're sparing what? Carbohydrate is right. Okay, so want you to work together or alone if you prefer and uh, finish out with the table. If it's a resting value, it's going to increase from pre to post.
with LT2? That's the, um, it stands for lactate threshold 2. So sometimes it's called the ventilatory threshold. So you, that would be where your breathing frequency goes up. That would be the, the anaerobic threshold, in other words. Thank you all. Does anybody need a little more time? A bit, a little bit longer if you need it. So we said if it's, a, if it's a maximal value, it goes up. If it's a submaximal value, it goes down. If it's a resting value, it goes up. So getting into this, okay, so the lactate max, the maximal value of lactate is going to go up. So going from 12 to 13.5. Uh, the lactate value at 6 miles per hour, so that's a submaximal value. So what direction are we doing? Are we going to go? It's going to go down. So at six miles per hour, submaximal value is going to go from 2.8 to 2.3 at post. Uh, VO2 at six miles per hour. So again, submaximal value. So that's going to go from 35 to 34. Uh, resting ATP. So if it's a resting value, what happens? It goes up. So we got more ATP. So 3.5 to 5.5 millimoles per gram of wet muscle. Uh, resting PC, PCR, it's going to go up. So more, more phosphate creatine storage going from 10 to 15 at post. Resting glycogen, <laughs> you seeing a pattern here? Yeah, so glycogen storage, we have more fuel in our muscles. So going from 111 to 80 millimoles per gram. Uh, number of mitochondria. Resting value, again, so it's pretty pretty easy to identify once you know those rules. Uh, so going from 0.45 to 1.08 millimoles um, cubed. Uh, glycogen phosphorylase is, is going to go up. So resting uh, values or, or baseline values and so on is going to go up. So going from 5 to 7 millimoles per kilogram. Uh, running velocity at LT2. So I should have explained that a little more. LT2 is just another way of describing the anaerobic threshold. So the, thresh the threshold at which we go from predominantly oxidative metabolism to anaerobic uh, is going to go up. So we're able to run faster before crossing the anaerobic threshold. So 7 to 8.5. So, do you have any questions on that? Pretty straightforward? Okay. All right, let's keep training. So, influence of age and sex on metabolic training and adaptations. So, uh, males and females, the elderly, uh, gain strength at the same rate. Strength at the same rate. Um, but it's through slightly different mechanisms. So, uh, generally speaking, uh, females and elderly the emphasis is more on neural activation versus hypertrophy. So uh, there's a decline in the ability to build muscle mass with age. And that has a lot to do with hormones and satellite cells, things like that. Um, satellite cells are stem cells that are specific to skeletal muscle. 
So we have fewer of them, which means a muscle can't regenerate as well and grow bigger uh, with age. Um, but we can gain strength at the same rate um, as it happens through neural activation. So taking the muscle that you have and increasing your ability to activate more fibers. So more of the muscle cells you have are, are activated and used for a task. Um, whereas uh, in younger males especially, uh, the gains in strength come from a mixture of both, from greater ability to activate muscle cells um, as well as increasing the contractile force of each individual cell. So um, that's, as, as you might already guess, that's due to a difference in those anabolic hormones. Okay. Um, in terms of VO2 max, children can improve their endurance time to exhaustion, uh, so, uh, but they improve endurance exercise performance without a significant improvement in VO2 max. So we don't see improvements in VO2 max uh, until adolescence. And, and there's reasons for that, we'll talk about it, but um, children have an incredible capacity to improve endurance performance. Um, so uh, in, in my hometown, uh, back in Utah, Wells, Wellsville, Utah is my hometown, and every spring they have this event where they invite all the elementary schools from the area, and they call it the Wellsville Mile. And so you have fourth and fifth graders that are running this, this mile around the town square, and it's a huge event. Uh, but you get fourth and fifth graders that can run, you know, the top finishers in a little under six minutes. And so these incredible times for fourth and fifth graders to, to run a mile. Um, and they have this whole build up to it where they're, they're doing activities in physical education and things through the year to, to improve their mile time. Um, the reason for the lack of improvement in VO2 max. So we're improving endurance performance, but it's not through a change in oxygen consumption. Um, it could be through greater efficiency is one hypothesis. But um, especially in a, in a smaller person like a child, there's only so much space in a cell. So you have three parts that take up a lot of space. You have the contractile apparatus. So those are all the filaments, the actin, the myosin that bind together to create pores. You have the sarcoplasmic reticulum that also regulates contraction because that's where the calcium's at. Um, and then you have the mitochondria and you have very little space for those mitochondria. And that happens to be the part that's important for an increase in VO2 max. So you've got smaller muscle cells in these kids um, without much space for the mitochondria. So they're able to improve endurance, but it's not through the usual mechanism like in adults where you have an increase in oxygen consumption. So um, there's greater space allocated to the contractile proteins as well as the sarcoplasmic uh, reticulum in the kids. So uh, let's talk about detraining for a little bit. What does the word detraining mean? Detraining. Yeah, yeah. So you train and you get all these changes. And then for one reason or another, you stop training and what happens? There's reversibility going on. So detraining, well, there's a loss of these changes that took place. So the adaptations go in reverse. You're reverting back to a baseline state. Um, it's not the same for aerobic and anaerobic fitness. So the metabolic factors that improve the most with training, like aerobic fitness, are also the fastest to go away with detraining. So define detraining is the partial or complete loss of training-induced anatomical, physiological, and performance adaptations in response to an insufficient training stimulus. So due to, due to injury or a change in your occupation or just whatever life throws at you, uh, we can have periods of time where um, exercise is not 
part of our lives and so our bodies undergo changes and hopefully we can plan and no matter what changes happen in our lives we can still include include exercise as a part because it's so important for psychological and physical health um, so in terms of aerobic fitness um, a lot of it depends on your training status so if you're just uh, recreationally trained so you jog on a, on a consistent basis um, after three to six weeks your aerobic fitness returns to baseline levels okay. um, especially if you haven't been training very long um, for highly trained individuals so we're talking about really good endurance athletes um, you don't revert back to baseline um, but there is some reversibility going on. So there'll be an initial rapid decline and then it'll kind of plateau out at a level that will that, that's higher than what your baseline was. Um, another key point, very important, anaerobic fitness variables. So sprint ability, muscle size, muscle strength, power, those things have less relative decline um, with detraining, um, so there's less relative loss. So the, the rate of decline for the anaerobic fitness is slower. Um, the flip side of that is the gains in anaerobic fitness are also smaller. So anaerobic fitness, you get a little bit of change, but then if there's any detraining period, the rate of decline is slower. Aerobic fitness, you get a lot of change, and the rate of decline is faster. Um, so that's why sprint performance is more maintainable with them in activity versus endurance performance. And of course, if it's complete immobilization, it's really bad. It really accelerates the loss of these fitness characteristics. Okay, so do you have any questions? Okay, so can I help you with the review activity? So let's, let's spend some time together. How are we doing? Okay, so we got plenty of time. So you have a choice. I can kind of walk you through this. We can do this together. You can work on, on your own. What would you? Together? Okay, so let's take a few notes and just kind of have a little discussion here. So, uh, so there are six different topics. So this is kind of a, an overview of what you should know by now with an exercise physiology course. Uh, so topic one, glycolysis. So it doesn't need to be extensive, but if, if you were asked what is glycolysis, short definition, what is it? What are we breaking down? Break down a glucose. Good. How many reactions is it? Ten. It's 10. You go from glucose to what? Glucose. Step one. Step 10. We are now at what molecule? Pyruvate. Pyruvate. Okay, so we've divided glucose in half. And now we have two, three carbon pyruvate molecules. So that's glycolysis. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. So, um, how many steps are involved in glycolysis then? How many steps to go from glucose to pyruvate? You said, yeah, there's 10. Uh, okay. So, to break down one molecule of glucose, two molecules, yeah, there's, so there's 10. Uh, next one. Which steps of glycolysis spend ATP? So if you're starting with blood glucose, what steps? One and three. Very good. Uh, how many ATP are spent? You're spending one at step one, and you're spending another at step three. So a total of two ATP are spent, or invested, we could say. So the next one, which steps of glycolysis make ATP? Seven and ten. Seven and ten. And if every step after step five is repeated twice, how many total do we make? Four. Four. 
which step of glycolysis generates NADH plus H, a green ion? So that's step six. Step six. So what happens to those hydrogens? Mm -hmm. So they got to go where to get to the electron transport chain? Mitochondria. What do we know about skeletal muscle that's different than cardiac muscle, though? Different shuttles. So in skeletal muscle, those hydrogens are actually passed to what other carrier across the membrane? FAD is right. Which is why we have less total ATP with skeletal muscle versus cardiac muscle. Okay, so what is the net ATP yield from glycolysis is starting with blood glucose? So completely break it down, all the hydrogens through the electron transport chain, what's your net? 30 is correct, 30 is correct, starting with blood glucose. So what if you start with glucose from glycogen? 31, yeah, so you spend, invest one less at the, at the very beginning. So rate limiting enzyme of glycolysis. Yep, phosphofructokinase, and it's a rate limiter because it's slowest. That's the slowest one. Okay, so anything else with glycolysis? Okay. All right, so what if the one one last question? So step six, NADH plus H. What if the mitochondria is not accepting those hydrogens? What happens to them? What does NADH do? Hands those hydrogens to pyruvate, and that's what makes lactate. So NADH has to be recycled because you have the next glucose that's coming, coming down the line, and we need NAD, so NAD has to do something with those hydrogens, gives them to pyruvate, we make lactate in, in those cases. Uh, so where is CO2? Oh, okay, so we're on to topic two, oxidative metabolism. Where is CO2 generated in the complete breakdown of glucose? Uh, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Very good. So that's stage two. Yeah, stage three in the Krebs cycle is right. So stage two, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Stage three, in the Krebs cycle. What steps of the Krebs cycle is NADH generated as well as FADH squared, respectively? Why don't you take a look? Take a look. See if you can find the Krebs cycle and look that one up. He's almost there. <laughs> yes. Three, four, and eight for NADH, and step six for FAD. So three, four, eight for NAD, step six for FAD. Three, four, eight, NAD, step six, FAD. So the very next question, what step in the Krebs cycle is ATP produced? Yep, step five. So again, NAD was three, four, eight. FAD is six. ATP is five. So why is there 2.5 ATP per NADH plus hydrogen ion? but 1.5 ATP per molecule of FADH squared. 
has to do with the entry into the electron transport chain. So uh, NAD has an earlier entry versus FAD. Drops off the hydrogens at the first cytochrome versus FAD drops them off at the second. Okay, so it just has to do with where hydrogens are, are dropped off in the electron transport chain. So which atom is the final hydrogen ion electron acceptor then? Oxygen, so you put two hydrogens together with an oxygen and what do you make? Some water. So what is the net ATP yield for complete breakdown of one molecule of glucose and skeletal muscle starting with blood glucose? I think we answered that already, it's 30, 30 ATP and starting with blood glucose. Okay, so we're ready for the phosphatin system. Okay, so how many grams of creatine are produced by the body per day? Produced by the liver, one. So your body makes one gram of creatine per day. You also generally get one gram from your diet. So we make one gram. Where is the creatine produced in the body? It's in liver. What amino acids are utilized to make creatine? So that's arginine. This is all from chapter three. Arginine, glycine, methionine. Arginine, glycine, methionine. So this is chapter three. Mm -hmm. so we stuff out. Right at the beginning of chapter three. In fact, uh, let me just give you a give you a page number that would help. So there's there's a nice section that talks uh, specifically about creatine right here on page fifty nine. Where all of that information is at. So where in a muscle is creatine phosphorylated? So as, as noted there in the article, it's in the mitochondria is where we add the phosphate to creatine. Okay, so any questions? Ready for topic four? Okay. So what is the first phase of fatty acid oxidation called? Where does it take place? Yeah, beta oxidation. And that's uh, in the mitochondria. So that's the only place where we're able to break down fatty acids is in the mitochondria. We can partially break down glucose in the cytoplasm with glycolysis. But all of fatty acid breakdown happens in the mitochondria. So beta oxidation is the first phase. Why does one molecule of palmitic acid, so that has 16 carbons, it's a common fatty acid, generate 106 net ATP, whereas one molecule of glucose only generates 30 net ATP. Uh, yes, so it, ha it has to do with the number of carbons. So talking about 16 carbons for palmitic acid versus six carbons for glucose. So the more carbon you have, the more acetyl-CoA you can make. How many carbons are in acetyl-CoA? Two. So you make, you make more. Uh, and also you don't produce uh, CO2. Uh, with beta oxidation, whereas you lose some of those. Remember the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl CoA, you make some carbon dioxide. So you lose some carbon in that step. With uh, beta oxidation, you don't make carbon dioxide. So you're able to preserve more of those carbons. So take home message is more carbons. That's the reason. 
So more carbons means more acetyl-CoA. More acetyl-CoA means going through the Krebs cycle. And you make more NAD at what steps? Three, four, and eight. FAD is at step, step six. So those hydrogens are going into the electron transport chain. Okay, so on the back, we're moving. Uh, lactate. So why is lactate produced in skeletal muscle? Why do we make lactate? Um, it's like an effort to try to block the hydrogen. Yes. Uh, so lactate, where it's 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 we're able to recycle NAD because if NAD can't put those hydrogens in the mitochondria, it's got to do something. So it gives them to pyruvate, which is how we get lactate. Um, Fast twitch versus slow twitch. Which one's more likely to make lactate regardless of oxygen availability? Fast twitch cells like to make lactate. So regardless of how much oxygen there is, whether it's enough or not, fast twitch fibers like to convert pyruvate to lactate. And why is that? What's the isoform in fast twitch fibers? Four and five versus slow twitch. One and two, more likely to take pyruvate, put it in the mitochondria. So is it possible to produce a lot of lactate with sufficient oxygen present? Kind of just answered that, and yes. Especially if it's fast twitch muscle. So why is there a connection between high level of blood lactate and muscle fatigue? So in our, in our lab last week, remember, a lot of you had, so it seemed like the range of values for the class was somewhere between like eight and 14, following the, the bike test, eight and 14. So whereas your baseline was somewhere between, seemed like one to three, right in there. So, why is there a connection between a high level of lactate in your blood and muscle fatigue? So as I was observing, all of you seem like you experienced some level of fatigue with that test. So why would you be fatiguing and also have a lot of lactate in your blood? What's the connection there? <laughs> That's the purpose of this whole class because we didn't teach it this way back when I had this class 30 years ago. So hydrogen ions, that's the connection because if we're making lactate, we know that we're also getting these hydrogen ions and it's, it's the high concentration of these that causes muscle pain, causes failure of muscle contraction. So that's what, that's what acids do is they release hydrogen ions. So if we make, if, if, so if we're going with the classical theory, even if we make lactic acid, the moment we make it, what happens to it? It dissociates into what? Lactate and hydrogen ions. Lactate's not the problem. It's just indirect evidence that we are becoming increasingly acidic in, in our muscles. So, okay, so just answered the next one kind of. So what's the difference between lactic acid and lactate? So, uh, lactate is, is, this is more than it is, the acid salt of lactic acid. So lactate is what we actually see in the body because with our body's pH, which is kind of, it's neutral, isn't it? We have kind of a neutral pH. If you make la uh, lactic acid under those conditions, it immediately dissociates into lactate and and hydrogen ions. So if you're producing lots of lactate, you can guarantee that you're starting to get more hydrogen ions. If you can't buffer those adequately, then muscles will start to shut down. So lactate is what is in the body. Lactic acid is the lactate content. Again, you're, the author of this book walks a really fine line. I can just imagine reviewers on both sides of the issue. So she's trying to please both sides. So regardless of whether you go with the new paradigm or the classical theory, the problem is still hydrogen ions. Um, so even if you go with the classical theory and you're saying, okay, the end product of glycolysis is lactic acid, 
what happens to the lactic acid as soon as you make it? It dissociates to lactate and the hydrogen ion. If you go with the new theory, the new theory says we never make lactic acid. We make the acid salt of lactic acid, which is lactate. And the production of lactate is good because the conversion of pyruvate to lactate does what? It consumes hydrogen ions. So regardless of what side of the debate, I, I don't know if it's much of a debate because what it really comes down to is, is it's the hydrogen ions that create the problem. Okay, so please explain the following reaction and how the body deals with lactic acid. So you're, you're saying, okay, classical view, we have lactic acid, we have buffers that take care of that. So it's like antacids for, antacids for your muscles. Um, so we have sodium bicarbonate that combines with lactic acid to make sodium lactate and carbonic acid, carbonic acid. And then those two react to make water and carbon dioxide. What do we do with the carbon dioxide at the very end? Yep, and it gets exhaled. So we call this non-metabolic production of carbon dioxide because it's not carbon dioxide produced in metabolism. So remember we said carbon dioxide is produced where? Stage two and stage three. So this is non-metabolic production of carbon dioxide. This is a buffering reaction to keep our pH uh, neutral. So does everybody understand, understand the reaction and why it's not metabolic CO2? So ask questions. Okay, are we okay to keep, keep going? Okay, all right, so let's, let's keep going. Uh, so considering the above reaction, why would the RER not be a valid indicator of fuel use under conditions of high intensity exercise above the anaerobic threshold? Okay, so let's break that down. So what is the respiratory exchange ratio? How do we calculate it? Carbon dioxide produced divided by oxygen consumed. Okay, so the reason is that the carbon dioxide produced value would go up, which would create a higher respiratory exchange ratio. Okay, now carbon dioxide produced. We're assuming that, where does that carbon dioxide come from? What's the assumption with the RER? Well, it has to be a steady state. Okay, steady state. Are we producing a lot of lactate or lactic acid in a steady state? If we're in steady state, generally speaking, lactic acid production or lactate is going to be pretty minimal. Okay. So the respiratory exchange ratio, it takes into account carbon dioxide that is produced during breakdown of glucose. So remember pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and then the Krebs cycle we make some carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide produced divided by oxygen consumed. Okay, so now let's increase the exercise intensity above anaerobic threshold. We're making lactic acid or lactate. And according to this equation, what are we also getting at the very end? Water and what else? Carbon dioxide. Is that carbon dioxide at the very end of that equation part of glucose breakdown? No, it's not. So that would interfere with the validity of the RER, wouldn't it? Because what you exhale at the mouth is assumed that that's what you're producing through metabolism, but this is non-metabolic production of CO2. So that would throw off your the validity of the RER ratio. So you're making... Carbon dioxide is part of the buffering process, but not part of metabolism, which is what the RER is based on. So everybody, everybody good with that? Okay, I know it's 
All right. All right. Let's let's keep going. Let's let's get through this and we'll we'll wrap it up. So. Okay, considering the above reaction, why would the ventilatory, ventilatory threshold correlate with the lactate threshold or anaerobic threshold? So there was that slide right at the end of chapter three PowerPoint. So ventilatory threshold is this point where you have an increase in the frequency of breathing without an increase in oxygen consumption. So it's kind of like you're breathing more frequently. So it indicates you've crossed the anaerobic threshold. Meaning that your oxygen consumption is not increasing to keep rate with your ventilation. So things are getting more acidic. You've crossed the anaerobic threshold. You've got these hydrogen ions that are interfering with muscle contraction. And these hydrogen ions are sending signals to your brain and your brain thinks, okay, well, I can correct this problem by doing what? Breathing. Breathing harder. And so you hang on for a little while. How long can we stay above the anaerobic threshold before our muscles are just shot and we have to drop back down? A few minutes. A few minutes before our bodies say, okay, that's enough. We're going to drop back into the oxidative uh, area. Above that threshold? Yeah, that's where they contribute or help the oxidative system is above that threshold. So, um, so the ventilatory threshold would correlate with the anaerobic threshold because we're producing more uh, lactate, which means hydrogen ions, which means more acidity, which means breathing harder. Okay. So what does the body do with lactate following high intensity exercise? Move it, move it. Yeah, we convert, we convert it back to glucose. Okay, we can Uh -huh. Yeah, so there's things that we uh, we can have liver and heart that takes it up, uses it for ATP. So it's a it's a substrate. It's, it doesn't hang around very long. Our body uses it. So what are those lactate carriers? MCT one and four monocarboxylate transporters common to skeletal muscle. So how long does it take to clear lactate approximately? 30 minutes? Yeah, about 30 minutes, give or take. So you're gonna have, if we were, if I made you hang around lab longer, 30 minutes after your test, you would have taken a, a sample and it probably would have been back down to between one and three. So the clearance is pretty fast, it's not, you know, it doesn't hang around for days. So, uh, why would there be an elevation in blood lactate during the initial warm-up period? So, during the oxygen deficit period, why do we have a little bit of elevation in blood lactate? What does that indicate? Yeah, so oxidative system is still getting up to speed with the intensity, and so the oxidative system is assisted by what energy system? Fast glycolysis or glycolytic system. So I guess overall from topic five, I, I think we need to shift our paradigm not thinking of lactate as a bad thing. It's kind of an indirect, it's indirect evidence of an increasingly acidic state. But, but lactate is not the, the villain that I think for decades we made it out to be. Okay, so topic six. What is the key assumption regarding the validity of the RER ratio? Steady state. Yep, you gotta be steady state for it to be valid. If it's not steady state, then we're getting CO2 from uh, buffering of lactic acid. So if the RER ratio is 0.85 at rest, what percentage of carbohydrate, what's the percentage of fat and carbohydrate utilization? Mm-hmm. 
So 51% fat, 49% carbohydrate at rest. So what direction does the RER move during the period of EPOP? Yeah, lower, which means more fat utilization, means more oxygen uptake. For every liter of oxygen you consume, how many calories do we expend? So a lot of those calories would be coming from fat, 60% of those. So we could say three out of every five calories from every liter of oxygen would be coming from fat. Okay, so please explain the basic premise of the ketogenic diet. We're back at the ketogenic diet. Does anybody remember that? So we have to, carbohydrates make up those Krebs cycle intermediates. How many steps do we have in the Krebs cycle? Eight, right? Eight steps in the Krebs cycle. And each of those steps, we have a substance that's produced through a reaction that's controlled by an enzyme. So if we have a lack of carbohydrates, we have less of those substances that make up the Krebs cycle. So step eight, we make oxaloacetate. So with a lack of carbohydrates, or in the case of starvation, oxaloacetate is converted into what? Glucose. So now acetyl-CoA is coming through stage two of metabolism. Typically, two carbon acetyl-CoA combines with a four carbon oxaloacetate to make a six carbon citrate. But what if oxaloacetate is not there anymore? It's been diverted into the, into the gluconeogenic pathway. Yeah, so acetyl-CoA is converted into ketone bodies or ketones. Not the same thing as keto acids. So pyruvate and all those Krebs cycle intermediates are keto acids. So ketones and ketone bodies. So what are those three? Beta hydroxy, acetone, acetoacetate. Okay, those three. Um, what can we use those for? The brain especially needs those because we can't store carbs in the brain, so the brain takes those up, use those for ATP production. Approximately how much oxygen is consumed in a baseline resting condition? How much oxygen are you consuming right now per kilogram of body mass? Everybody, what's the baseline value? 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body mass per minute in a resting state. So that's a relative value. In absolute terms, someone with more body mass would be consuming more oxygen, but in relative terms, 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So for an amino acid to be oxidized for ATP, which part of an amino acid must first be removed via oxidative deamination? The amino group. Yeah, so that's the chemical formula. The amino group, nitrogen containing amino group NH2 must be removed. What's the difference between, what's the key difference between oxidative deamination and transamination? So oxidative deamination, we're completely removing the nitrogen containing amino group. We add another hydrogen to it to make ammonia, and ammonia converted to urea. What about transamination? What are we doing? We're not removing the amino group. What are we doing with it? We're transferring it. So glutamate is transferred into alanine. alanine. Do you remember that slide that we looked at where alanine is kind of the most common of those? And then we can take alanine and convert it to, to glucose. So, okay. Any other final questions? You have your study guide, you have this, PowerPoints, there was that handout with question from chapter three. Okay. Okay, so because we have an exam on Thursday, um, who has lab on Thursday? Okay, if you'd rather take the lab exam today, I don't, it's up to you.
You can. You can take the lab midterm today and then the lecture midterm on Thursday, or you can do the lecture midterm Thursday and then the lab midterm on Thursday as well. Lab midterms open note. Okay, so all up to you if you want to show up at 2 o'clock in the lab to, to do that, it's up to you.